Gary has received numerous awards. Most notably, he was twice named Dallas CEO Magazine's CEO of the Year and was named one of the best CEOs in America by Institutional Investor Magazine three times. In November, he was inducted in the McCombs School of Business Hall of Fame at the University of Texas, Austin. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, I almost said Oklahoma. <laughs> yeah, I'm only kidding. He has previously served as a, on the President's Job Council. Um, it's great to have you here today. On the interviewing side, we are pleased to have Michael Durgin. Mike is Managing Director at CRT Capital Group. He has an extensive Wall Street experience in the transportation sector. Prior to CRT Capital, he held positions with FTN Equity Capital Markets, Tiger Management, and other financial organizations. Before his Wall Street career, Mike had management positions with Pan Am and American Airlines. He has been a Wings Club member for more than 30 years. Welcome, Gary and Mike. Southwest is, is obviously a, a tremendously uh, successful company. Uh, your market value, as you know right now, is about $12.5 billion. It's, uh, it's the fifth, fourth largest market value uh, in, the, uh, in the industry. Uh, Southwest uh, historically has uh, uh, done a very good job financially. In the 70s, 80s, and 90s, it generated returns on invested capital in excess of 15%, and that far exceeded your cost of capital. But then in the last, since really starting in 2000, you have failed to do that. And really, the first question I have is, what was going right in the 70s, 80s, and 90s for you to earn your cost of capital? And what's gone wrong since then? And then, you know, and where are we now in terms of getting back to, you know, back to the future? 15% return on invested capital again. So we're going to pursue that with different Great. questions. Great. So. <clears throat> well, thanks, Mike. And, uh, uh, and thank you all for being here. This is, uh, this is a real treat. It's, uh, it's a, a very fun event. It's great to be in New York City and great to be with, with all of you. Um, and it is a very exciting time for Southwest Airlines. Um, I wish we had a lot more time because I have a lot to say. Uh, and it's, uh, again, it's, we're very excited about uh, next year in particular. Uh, I'm going to talk about some forward-looking things and I may use non-GAAP numbers, and so if any of you uh, are interested or care about any of that stuff, you can go to our website, and it'll fully explain what all that garbage means. <laughs> but, uh, uh, no, you ask a great question, because, you know, I think what is very clear at this point in time is that the airlines that have been successful uh, over that period, uh, roughly uh, 30 to 40 years since deregulation, uh, it is a cost game. You recognize that early on. Uh, and like uh, many things uh, over time, uh, the market moves to a price uh, at that lowest cost uh, denominator. Uh, and we've been very, very successful uh, over our uh, 43 years uh, in, in accomplishing that and really setting that low cost bar. I would say that the one big difference uh, and actually, we had a record year uh, at the time in 2000, so it's really 2001 forward uh, that Mike is speaking about. Um, the, the, the biggest difference uh, since 2001 to today compared to that previous time period back to the early 70s is cost. Uh, and the biggest cost challenge since 2001 has been energy cost. Uh, and it, it's manifested in a number of different ways, but essentially when we have stable costs like we did throughout the 70s, throughout the 80s, and throughout the 90s, uh, we're able to maintain low fares, set expectations in customers' minds about what they can expect in terms of a fare, uh, and be in a position where we can uh, go into new markets, lower the fares competitively, and stimulate. When costs are going up, and fares are going up, it takes away that ability to stimulate. Uh, but it, it, essentially, we've had to really push revenues to overcome 
ever-increasing fuel costs. And as everybody here well knows, our fuel costs today compared to 2001 are up about six times. And if you just look at it in terms of our economics uh, in, in today's terms, that means that our fuel bill has gone up $5 billion a year. And this is for a company whose net income last year was roughly $450 million. So that's been a huge game changer. Now, unless something really crazy happens over the next two and a half weeks, uh, 2013 will be a year where we do earn our cost of capital. Uh, and we're very pleased uh, with the progress that we've been making. So the challenge for us, Mike, has been to maintain that low cost um, DNA uh, and at the same time make changes to adjust to the new realities, which are primarily higher energy costs, uh, and, and still have that low fare brand uh, in our customers' mind. Fuel is obviously a big cost item, and it's, as you said, uh, it was a lot easier having low fares when fuel or, you know, was $30 a barrel as opposed to $100 a barrel. And at least stable. And at least stable. Uh, um, but there are, other, uh, there are other, as you say, cost problems in the sense that because you have not uh, filed for bankruptcy and you've made money for 40 years in a row, which is remarkable for any company in any industry, for an airline, it's totally uh, in, insane, quite frankly, unheard as my of. daughters would say. Totally unheard of. Yes. <laughs> unheard of. <laughs> and, uh, and also having an investment grade balance sheet is also unheard of in the airline industry. Right. So you've done an incredible job, but one of the out, uh, you know, outgrowths of that is that your labor costs are at the highest end of the spectrum, and that's about 40% of your costs. And uh, I know you have uh, contracts with all your groups, uh, uh, you know, in negotiation. And I just wonder, uh, obviously, the culture at Southwest is tremendous. The employees are very supportive. They understand working for a company that's made money 40 years is, is why you can have top, you know, wages. Is there some flexibility, though, looking forward to have a little bit more of a variable cost structure on the labor side so that maybe in the future labor costs are more t t directly tied to, to, you know, the profits of the company and, and that, uh, you know, because it seems to me that one of your goals, I think going forward, has to be keeping your unit costs, excluding fuel, at least flat if not down. I just wonder what your, what your goals are on the unit cost side as well. Well, yeah, Mike, you, you, are, you are so right. Uh, fuel is just a part of this cost equation. Uh, you know, and one other, while you were talking, one other uh, point occurs to me, which is the relationship between price and traffic, which in the prices, of course, set by cost, I think something everybody would be interested to know, the traffic domestically in the United, in the United States for all of last year was only about 1% more than it was in the year 2000. So said a different way, with the traffic has not grown if you look at 2012 compared to 2000. Why is that? Traffic was growing domestically all the way until 2007. Then we have the recession, which as we know will definitely uh, shave a lot of business travel in particular, and it has not recovered because costs have continued to climb higher Fares have continued to climb higher, and it has destroyed a lot of traffic uh, across the United States. Uh, so costs are important, number one, and it is more than just energy cost. There is a, uh, a Fortune article that just came out today uh, pointing out that low cost doesn't have to mean low wages. And Southwest Airlines was one of the, Linda, I think three or four companies that was profiled in this article today. Very proud of the fact that we don't get low cost by paying low wages. And we're very, very proud of that. How do we get our low cost then? It's because we outwork all of our competitors. Uh, I think that our people are smarter, and I do think that they work harder. Uh, we already have variable components built into our cost structure and that's with profit sharing. Uh, and I'm uh, pretty sure of my memory on this, that Southwest Airlines was the first airline 
to, to introduce a profit sharing plan uh, all the way back in the 1970s. Uh, and so it, uh, our, our employees will be rewarded when the company performs better and when times are tougher, uh, the rewards aren't as great. However, because we have been profitable every single year, there has been profit sharing every single year. So our employees have done very, very well. Clearly, we'll want to do more of that in the future uh, because it is all about being the low-cost producer. Uh, that is our brand going back to the very beginning, and it's something that we not just cherish. We, that, that is our future. If we don't hold on to low cost and low fares, uh, then Southwest Airlines will not be the largest airline in America. Uh, it will uh, shrink from here, and of course we're all determined not to let that happen. In looking out at the, uh, at the future, going, going, again, going forward on, on capacity, um, there's, a, there's a number of, of initiatives uh, at play here. Uh, so we have AirTran, integration going on it's not it's sort of it's suboptimal as you would admit until it's finally completed I'd like right. to talk about that you have the right amendment ending next year opening up the possibility of long-haul service I had three questions in the cocktails about when are you flying from LaGuardia nonstop to uh, to La Field uh, I'll have to ask you that so <laughs> just the pay for my drinks. <laughs> you have, uh, you have uh, international uh, service uh, on the horizon, currently with AirTran, your own international, and then obviously with Hobby in uh, 15, opening up for international, and with the 800s coming in, you've got an ideal plane for that. There's a lot of initiatives, and I'm sure I've left some out, but those are the three that uh, along with the aircraft re reconfig. Uh, so maybe kind of go over that and, and, and kind of review your capacity plans going forward. Uh, at what point, are, you know, what is the outlook for capacity for 14 to start with? And going beyond that, do we expect a major ramp up or is it still going to be kind of a modest uh, kind of growth? Well, you know, I'll, uh, I'll give our folks credit uh, that in, in 2007 uh, that we recognized that something was happening in the economy and that was the year we came to New York in uh, December as I recall Tammy and uh, laid out our, our strategy to slow our growth and that was the year that traffic peaked in the United States I think it was 475 million ONDs in that year and it's now down into the 430 uh, million range uh, here in 2012. Um, so we slowed our growth based on what we were seeing, which was slowing demand. Of course, that was just the beginning of the recession, uh, and then uh, travel traffic numbers plunged in 2008 because of higher energy prices and soaring fares. And then, of course, the recession happened after that. So. We began uh, really in earnest to think about some earnings drivers that we wanted to implement in Southwest Airlines and transform Southwest from really being so dependent upon short haul markets uh, and uh, creating more capabilities, expanding our customer experience to appeal to more customers as well. And I think that that's worked out uh, just uh, fabulously. Uh, where we are today in 2013 is, um, again, barring something really crazy, we're going to have a record year. We are going to earn our cost of capital. Uh, we have uh, dramatically improved the Southwest customer experience, uh, and we are moving right through our strategic plan, uh, which will, in large part, come together in 2014. 2014 will be a historic year for Southwest Airlines. We'll announce in January uh, our plans, uh, our schedule, rather, for international service, and that'll be a first uh, in our 43-year history. I'm very excited about that. That program is right on track. Uh, it is tens of millions of dollars worth of expense uh, and over 18 months worth of work, uh, and it is, uh, I couldn't be more proud of our people, especially our technology department, for leading that effort. So that'll be a big effort for next year. 
That will enable us to move the remaining AirTran flying that is international into Southwest Airlines in 2014, again, uh, uh, right in accordance with our plan. Big economic drivers that are helping this year, uh, you've touched upon. Uh, we have added the 800s to our fleet. Uh, we've added um, the evolved seating configuration with our next-gen aircraft. Uh, we're retiring our older classic 737s as well as the Boeing 717 uh, airplanes, and that will be replaced by much more productive uh, from an economic perspective, 737s into the fleet. So all of those are paying dividends already in 2013, and we'll see more of that in 2014. Those two things, the 717 retirement and the launch of the International, will facilitate the final conversion of AirTran into Southwest, and that'll all be wrapped up next year. So each one of those are important, and it will put us in a position, as you mentioned, to optimize our network and our route schedule, and clearly it is not uh, optimized at this point uh, with the two, uh, two separate brands. Uh, so that's all very, very exciting. The Wright Amendment repeal goes into effect on October the 13th of next year. Uh, we'll be announcing that schedule uh, in the first quarter of 2014, uh, coincident with our normal uh, schedule rhythm, and uh, I can assure you that we will have nonstop flights uh, that are long haul out of Dallas. How bold is that? <laughs> and I can assure you that New York LaGuardia will eventually, if not immediately, get service from Southwest. But until we announce our routes, uh, obviously I'll keep all that close to the vest. But we have some wonderful opportunities to bring more competition and lower fares uh, where we don't currently serve markets and long haul out of Dallas has long suffered from high fares, uh, and they will very soon be freed from that tyranny. <laughs> <laughs> or something like that. Um, so let me, let me uh, so just follow up uh, on two, two, two numbers to try to pin you down. Uh, one is on kind of capacity growth, roughly speaking? We'll be flat next year. Okay. We'll be flat next year, and the acquisition of AirTran, uh, the uh, fleet modernization efforts, uh, and the implementation of new inter international reservations capabilities will put us in a position where we have a number of growth opportunities available to us in terms of places to go. So that's one requirement. That will be in place before 2015. The second requirement is we have to be earning more than our cost of capital in order to justify more investment in the business. And uh, we have a very solid performance uh, under our belt here for 2013, puts us in a wonderful position to finish uh, uh, the, the, the work that we have to drive the economics to hit that uh, return on capital target for 2014. We have a plan that achieves it. And it's a very realistic plan, and it's one that all of our people are very determined to make. And I think in the past you've said unit costs excluding fuel longer term. I think your goal is to have it lower. Is that Absolutely. Still, so that's that, still that, a that, case. that is a must. Okay. That is an imperative. Because you need that, that to have lower prices to, yes, to stimulate and, demand. And again, history shows that it's the low-cost producer in most industries, but certainly in this one, they're going to be the ones that are successful for the long term. If we want to grow, if we want our shareholders to prosper, if we want our employees to prosper, then maintaining low cost is the key to, uh, uh, to achieving those goals. Okay, so let's turn to the revenue side of the profit equation. Uh, and uh, it was interesting, the other day, uh, Delta had an investor day, and they had an interesting chart uh, up there from uh, business travel news. It, it was a survey of of corporate travel managers. Uh, they do it once a year. And it had about 10 categories. And Delta had it up there because they were number one in every category except one, you know. And, and that one that they didn't mention, but I will uh, today was, was a price value uh, 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 provided by an airline. And that was Southwest. You actually were number one in that survey, I think for the Maybe for the first time, because I don't. And so I'm kind of going back to the to 
your customer mix? Because I actually was looking at that really from a Delta perspective and an American United. I kind of per view them as uh, kind of the global business travel airlines. But so I was a bit surprised to see you ranking so high among corporate travel managers. And there were a couple other uh, uh, questions uh, where you also came in second. So it was not like a fluke. It was, it was, uh, I think, customer service as well as uh, some other uh, handling of, of issues with them that uh, you came in quite high. So, I mean, so I'm just curious, uh, looking at your business mix between, let's just simplistically, business, leisure, uh, about what percentage is business, what percentage is leisure, and uh, what kind of programs are you in the working on to uh, to address getting as large a share of, of of those segments going forward? Well, Mike, Mike, you've you've sort of touched on a number of different things that yeah. I'd like to try to speak to here, right. and um, uh, so uh, I know you'll redirect me if we're not talking about exactly what you want. Um, first of all, we carry one in four customers in the United States. So 25% of the customers fly on Southwest Airlines today. That is by far larger than any other uh, airline. I think you have 130 million passengers? Uh, roughly. And, roughly. Yes, roughly. And uh, again, I'm talking O&Ds here. Right. Uh, about 35% uh, typically are flying for business reasons. Uh, so it's not such a reach to argue that if we're not the largest business airline, we've got to be close. So, there, so it doesn't surprise me, in other words, to hear that corporate travelers rank Southwest Airlines very high. And they like our fares. They like our schedule. They like our customer service. They like our on-time performance. All of those things are important. Uh, and... As you know, we have always focused on the basics uh, at Southwest Airlines, and I think that's paid a great dividends for us. The other thing, though, that I wanted to touch on is that, you know, our competitors love to increase fares, and we hate that. Uh, we have been forced to move our fares up over the last decade because of higher energy costs, and have not been able to offset higher energy prices with other cuts in our cost structure. Uh, so the only thing that's left at, at, a, at a point in time is to raise fares. So there was an, initi an initiative to raise fares this week, and we are not raising our fares. Uh, so we are, we're, we're out to prove to Americans that we are low fare. Uh, we're out to prove to everybody that we're here to compete, uh, and I'm very, very proud of that. So in talking about revenues, we want to rely on fare increases as little as possible uh, in terms of achieving uh, our uh, profit objectives. In the end, we've got to hit our return on capital uh, requirement. But if we can do that by being the low fare brand, that is preferred. So we've introduced uh, a different boarding process in 2007 with different products like Business Select uh, and Early Bird uh, as examples, just to give people more choice. Uh, and if things are important to them, at least make that kind of an offer. Uh, at the same time, we have been very determined not to nickel and dime our customers. Customers hate that. Uh, and I think that that is one reason that we are, in fact, the largest airline in America, because we are the easiest to do business with, and we have the best people. And in the end, uh, every brand survey that you see, uh, doesn't matter whether we do it or whether uh, outsiders take these surveys, Southwest is always near the top, sometimes first, sometimes second. Uh, but we're never last. Uh, and it is amazing how many times uh, our competitors uh, show up uh, last uh, in cons consistently in surveys. That translates to financial success as well. Uh, and all of these having all of these things, like having a very strong culture and a very strong brand, uh, are very important in terms of sustaining a company into the future. So let me let me talk about that again that price value uh, criteria that you come in so high on. I think part of that is related to the fact that you don't have fees right. in certain areas that right. I think in the case of business people perhaps uh, cancellation fees. I know I was out in the West Coast recently and the the fees wasn't on Southwest were were almost double the uh, the the price of the ticket and you are always 
changing you know, plans. So what's your uh, position on, on things like cancellation fees? Obviously, bags, I need to ask you about bags fly free. I mean, they, you, they, they do, the, yes. I know they do, I know. But that's obviously, as you know, pretty controversial. Uh, you is. know, you've got 130 plus customers, you know, some large percentage of those, you know, have bags. And I'm sure one of the reasons your costs are higher is it costs a lot of money to load all those bags. I see it myself. Uh, so there is obviously a rationale for charging for at least some, if, you, if not the first bag, maybe the second or third. And so you could sort of make a case that at some point you shouldn't categorically, you know, reject, you know, fees. But what do you, what do you have to say about that? Well, it, it, uh, first of all, it, it is interesting to me how um, interested people are in this topic and how interested people are in what Southwest does and what Southwest might do. So I would just, just uh, uh, share that anecdote. Uh, you got we, their attention on this one. We have fans. Right. We have, we have customers who love Southwest Airlines and are very loyal to it and very devoted to Southwest. And I think most companies would do anything to have that kind of relationship with their customers. Once you have it, you have to be very careful in, in terms of what you do to change that relationship. And we care very deeply about our people, and we also, in turn, our people care very deeply about our customers. Uh, that's just who we are. What is nice is, at least in today's competitive environment, you have a contrast. There are airlines that could not care one bit about their customers. And that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. That is just not who we are. The other point that I would make, I think, that people miss is that, especially when you talk about bags, you're talking about one feature of a whole customer experience. You will remember well, back in, in the 80s, there were analysts that were arguing, you will never, ever be successful, Southwest Airlines, unless you fill in the blank, assign seats, have business class. Uh, unless you increase your fares. They were wrong. Now, no one challenges us on those issues. We're the largest airline in America. So there's, there's evidence that would suggest that being different in a variety of ways actually is the better way to go uh, in terms of approaching the market. So the point is that you have to put the bags fly free in the context of the other things that we do. Because there are customers who may prefer an assigned seat or, or a bigger seat. And we don't do those kinds of things. So it's, it, all of that has to be looked in total. But in any event, uh, we've studied very carefully the, uh, the economic equation of whether we should charge for certain things or not. Uh, and our, our judgment and our, the empirical evidence is that we're, we actually make more money by getting more customers uh, by not uh, nickel and diming our customers. And that's certainly what our plan is going forward. Okay. I think, uh, Gary, thank you so much. I, I want to thank Mike, uh, Kevin, if I could. Mike is an old friend. And uh, it is a real treat for me to uh, have a conversation with you. But uh, uh, you do a great job, sir. And uh, it's, just, it's just great to be able to spend thank the time you. with you. So a round of applause. We, uh, we have a little memento we'd like to give to you for uh, doing such a terrific job today. Thank you very much. It is a silver commemorative coin of the Congressional, Congressional Medal of Honor Foundation. Um, it's out of circulation, so it's, a, uh, it's really a memento. And thank you thank so much. That's terrific. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. Really it. That's terrific. Well deserved. And then if you can stay here, Mike, we'll take a photo. And then, uh, Gary, uh, you're getting quite a collection of these plaques. I here. love them. Uh, it's, it, but uh, thank you so much. Another terrific job. Thanks, it's Kevin. always a pleasure. Great to be with you. Very, very much a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Gary.